Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Graphic Packaging Holding Company second quarter of 2020 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to Melanie Skegis, Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good morning and welcome to Graphic Packaging Holding Company's conference call to discuss our second quarter 2020 results. Speaking on the call will be Mike Doss, the company's President and CEO, and Steve Scherger, Executive Vice President and CFO. To help you follow along with today's call, we will be referencing our second quarter earnings presentation, which can be accessed on the investor section of our website at www.graphicpkg.com. I would like to remind everyone that statements of our expectations, plans, estimates, and beliefs regarding future performance and events constitute forward-looking statements. Such statements are based on currently available information and are subject to various risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from the company's present expectations. Information regarding these risks and uncertainties is contained in the company's periodic filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Undue reliance should not be placed on forward-looking statements as such statements speak only as of the date on which they are made and the company undertakes no obligation to update such statements except as required by law. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Melanie. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on the call today. I'm pleased to be with you to discuss our excellent results we delivered in the second quarter of 2020. Before we focus on financial results, I'd like to take a few moments to update you on the initiatives to keep employees and partners safe while continuing our essential operations supporting the food, beverage, consumer, and food service markets globally. Employees come first at Graphic Packaging. We continue to invest in added safety protocols, including plexiglass barriers on production lines, face masks for employees, temperature scanners, and enhanced cleaning and sanitation protocols designed specifically to prevent the spread of viruses, including influenza and COVID-19. While we have established and implemented safety protocols for our frontline employees, we have also executed technology solutions to enable our non-production employees to conduct their roles effectively from home. Workforce productivity and collaboration across our organization during these challenging times has exceeded my expectations. We have managed through the COVID-19 environment exceptionally well to date and have remained agile, approaching every day with a can-do attitude. Over the course of the last few months, we have often been recognized by customers for our flexibility, best-in-class service, and support through these volatile times. We attribute the exemplary customer service our teams provide directly to the focus we place on the well-being of our employees. Our teams have continued to perform for our customers and have gone above and beyond to provide continuity of supply. I thank everyone at Graphic Packaging for their ongoing and tireless efforts. I would also like to take a moment to discuss a very important topic of graphic packaging, diversity and inclusion. We believe a diverse and inclusive working environment encourages creativity, innovation, and collaboration. It enhances our ability to serve global customers, and it is why it is vital that our global organization reflects the diversity of the communities in which we operate. While diversity and inclusion has been a long-standing practice, it is more important than ever that we listen to our 19,000 employees worldwide and have conversations necessary to ensure all the employees have a sense of place and inclusiveness as members of the graphic packaging team. We benefit as an organization from a truly collective and diverse viewpoint. I commend all our employees around the globe for their teamwork and the care and support everyone continues to provide to one another every day. Our organization is committed to driving positive change for employees, customers, and the communities in which we operate. Meaningful, sustainable change starts with listening, and we are encouraging the voices of many across the company, and specifically with our human resources teams globally, to ensure our words and actions are congruent with the values of the company. Turning now to our financials on slides five and six, I will walk through some of the highlights for the second quarter. 
Sales increased 4% year-over-year while adjusted EBITDA of $260 million declined slightly from Q2 last year. Adjusted EBITDA was impacted by approximately $25 million in incremental planned maintenance downtime we incurred compared to the second quarter of 2019. It was largely offset by positive price, commodity input cost deflation, and strong productivity during the quarter. Overall execution was excellent. Net organic sales growth increased 1.5% compared to the second quarter of 2019. Positive at-home consumption trends and new product development initiatives more than offset the declines in our food service business. Net organic volume, as measured in tons, actually increased more than net organic sales dollars due to the market mix in the quarter that significantly impacted net organic tons sold on a favorable basis. We believe net organic sales growth in dollars is the best indicator of how we are performing versus our vision 2025 goals. Excluding the impact of price and foreign exchange, net organic sales growth for the first half of 2020 was 3% year over year, a strong start to achieving our long-term 100 to 200 basis point growth goal inherent in our vision 2025. Our paperboard integration rate improved 200 basis points from 68% in 2019 to 70% year to date. While Steve will talk in greater detail on quarterly financial results and our outlook for the year, I'm pleased to report we are reinstating full-year 2020 guidance today. After evaluating multiple scenarios as it relates to consumer demand and likely spending and consumption patterns in the second half of the year, we are reinstating our full-year adjusted EBITDA guidance in the range of $1.05 to $1.09 billion dollars representing a 4% growth year-over-year year at the midpoint and adjusted cash flow guidance in the range of 200 to $275 million. The operating environment remained relatively healthy in the second quarter, particularly in the food, beverage, and consumer markets we serve. Backlogs were five-plus weeks for CUK and CRB and four weeks for SBS. Operating rates for both CRB and SBS, as reported by the AFMPA, were 97%. Our estimated operating rate for our CUK continues to be very strong at 95 plus percent. We continue to closely monitor demand, specifically cup demand, for the food service markets. One of our paper machines in Texarkana is essentially dedicated to making SBS paperboard, which we subsequently convert into paper cups. Due to declines in paper cup demand, we have taken 14 days of market downtime so far in July on this paper machine. We intend to extend our planned maintenance downtime on the same line in September, adding 14 days of market downtime to the scheduled maintenance outage we have planned. We will continue to align our SPS supply with our forecasted recovery rate of the food service market. Currently, market downtime in our SPS cup paperboard production is expected to yield a reduction of 20 to 30,000 tons in the third quarter. In addition to taking the market downtime where needed, we have successfully transitioned and annualized 100,000 tons of integrated folding cartons from CUK to SBS paperboard. This has the dual benefit of meeting increased demand for our CUK beverage packaging, as well as leveraging our low-cost SBS mill platform. As a producer of all three paperboard substrates, CRB, CUK, and SBS, we are well positioned to move products among the end-use markets to meet changing volume requirements by market when needed. Moving to slide 7, you can see the progress we made in 2019 in year to date in 2020 on the price commodity input cost recovery. We remain committed to price offsetting commodity input costs over time and are pleased that we've been able to fully recover the dislocation that took place from 2016 to 2018. New product development continues with our customers even during these challenging times. Paper Seal Tray Solution is a product we are very excited about, and you'll see the details on slide eight. We began development a few years ago on the hermetically sealed paperboard tray that is well positioned to serve a wide range of food applications, including proteins, cheeses, salads, fruits, and frozen foods. We formally introduced Paper Seal in 2019 and are making products for customers in Europe and Australia today. 
We expect to be commercial with customers in North America early in 2021. We are encouraged about this opportunity to move into new markets, including protein packaging, with our innovative paper-based tray solution. As we discussed in Vision 2025 last September at our Investor Day, we are well positioned to capture sustainability-supported organic sales growth and to benefit from new product development for years to come. Work with new and existing customers on more sustainable packaging products, including paper seal, is reflective of the continued opportunity we see to bring new paper-based packaging solutions to the marketplace. While some COVID-related delays have been factored into the near-term outlook, multi-year sustainability-supported sales growth opportunities remain intact, and we continue to see a path to our 100 to 200 basis points net organic sales growth for the next several years. We are executing multiple beverage packaging installations in Europe that will support organic sales growth in 2021 and beyond. Notably, the first Keoclip machines have been installed for Coca-Cola European partners, and we are excited that commercial production will begin soon for this important customer. Our teams are also progressing on alternatives for polyethylene coated containers and cups, and we are confident in the development with customers today for conversions in 2021. Premiumization and custom structural packaging design are additional areas where we're seeing increased interest from customers as they look to differentiate their products in the marketplace with end-use consumer safety in mind. We are working closely with customers and continuously finding opportunities to develop innovative packaging solutions to refresh our pipeline and strengthen long-term partnerships. To date, this has been an incredible year of change and adaptation. Our teams had to quickly mobilize and operate under the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our production employees were nimble and adjusted quickly to changing demand patterns. Importantly, they maintained our continuity of supply to our vital food, beverage, consumer, and food service markets amid uncertainties with the pandemic, logistics challenges, and an occasional severe weather event. We entered the second half of the year with resolve to continue learning and improving from these events of this year and have confidence our teams will successfully manage the business during the current uncertain economic times. Steve, I'll hand the call over to you now for a more detailed discussion of our financial results. Thanks, Mike, and good morning. Turning to slide nine in our sales performance waterfall, net sales in the second quarter increased 4% from the prior year to $1.6 billion, driven by acquisitions, net organic sales growth, and continued flow through of positive pricing. Reported earnings for the quarter were 19 cents per diluted share, compared to 22 cents in the second quarter of 2019. Second quarter 2020 net income was negatively impacted by a net $21 million of special charges, nearly half of which was a one-time settlement accrual for a multi-employer pension plan. When adjusting for these charges, adjusted net income for the second quarter was $72 million, or $0.26 cents per diluted share, an increase of 8% compared to $0.24 cents per diluted share in the second quarter of 2019. Turning to slide 10, focused on our EBITDA waterfall. Second quarter 2020 adjusted EBITDA was $260 million. Adjusted EBITDA was positively impacted by $5 million of higher pricing, $15 million of net productivity improvement, $10 million in commodity input cost deflation, and $2 million of favorable foreign exchange. These benefits were offset by $2 million in unfavorable volume mix, $13 million in other inflation, primarily labor and benefits, and $25 million in planned maintenance outage expense incurred during the quarter. Turning to commodity input costs, we experienced a benign inflationary environment across most commodity categories, with the exception of secondary fiber. OCC costs saw a dramatic move higher in the months of February through May and reverted lower in the months of June and July. As Mike mentioned, we are committed to price offsetting commodity input costs over time, and we will continue to actively monitor the inflationary environment. On slide 11, you will see the decisive actions we are taking to position our business for success in both the current and long-term business environment. We are optimizing our network of mills and converting facilities 
and integrating acquisitions with the goal of increasing paperboard integration rates, expanding market participation, and driving profitability and cash flow. The closures we announced last quarter have been successfully completed. The integration of the Greif assets has exceeded our expectations to date. Synergy achievement is on track, including rationalization of two converting facilities into lower cost locations. The Kalamazoo project also remains on time and on budget and is expected to yield $100 million in annualized EBITDA improvements in the 2022 to 2023 timeframe. Moving to liquidity and our balance sheet. We have total available liquidity of $1.4 billion. Our balance sheet remains strong. We ended the quarter with $3.4 billion of net debt, reflecting an increase of $54 million during the quarter. Net leverage was 3.26 times at the end of the second quarter, compared to 3.18 times at the end of the first quarter. We expect to be within our two and a half to three times targeted range as we exit 2020. Moving to a discussion on our return of capital to stakeholders. Given recent volatility and the dislocation in our stock price relative to our view of the long-term intrinsic value of the company, we continued to repurchase shares in the second quarter of 2020. We repurchased $38 million of common shares at an average price of $12.59 per share, bringing our total open market shares repurchased in the first half of 2020 to $157 million. In addition to capital return to stakeholders, we also continue to invest in the business. Capital expenditures in Q2 were $154 million and include progress on our $600 million strategic CRB platform investment in Kalamazoo. Turning now to our partnership with International Paper, you can see on slide 12 an illustration of the optionality we have when monetizing International Paper's partnership units. While we do not have anything to report to you today relative to ongoing monetization, you can see in this hypothetical calculation the non-dilutive nature of a conversion if we were to utilize GPK stock as part of a monetization, and that we have significant flexibility in how we create value for stockholders. Before turning to our outlook, one housekeeping item. Our existing shelf registration statement expires later this month, and consistent with past practices, we will file a new one in the normal course this quarter. Turning now to a discussion of the current business environment on our outlook, we were pleased with our performance in the second quarter. Our team continued to execute well to meet the changing demand needs of our customers. Given sustained patterns of at-home consumption, solid first-half financial results, and assumed gradual pickup in our food service business, we are reinstating full-year guidance. Adjusted EBITDA for 2020 is projected to be in the range of $1.05 to $1.09 billion. Adjusted cash flow for the year is projected to be in the range of $200 to $275 million. On slide 13, you will find updates to the components of our guidance for the full year. Thanks for your time today, and I'll turn the call back to Mike. Mike? In closing, the first half of 2020 has been eventful, but as the results reflect, we have met the increased demand needs of our customers and have successfully overcome challenges presented by the global pandemic. Net sales and adjusted EBITDA are both up 5% in the first half of the year versus the same period one year ago. We are operating the business from a position of financial strength and flexibility with a keen focus on customer service, care for the employees, and return for stakeholders. We have reinstated our annual guidance that includes adjusted EBITDA growth and healthy cash flow for the year, maintained our dividend, and share repurchase programs all while continuing to invest for the long-term growth and achievement of our Vision 2025 goals. Thank you again for your interest in graphic packaging, and I'll now turn the call back over to the operator to begin Q&A. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, you may do so by pressing star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that is star one if you would like to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question is from Mark Wilde of Bank of Montreal. Morning, Mike. Morning, Steve. 
Hi, Mark. Hey, Mark. Uh, I wondered if you can just give us some sense of kind of activity levels uh, in July by kind of business lines, what you're seeing in kind of food, beverage, consumer versus what you're seeing in kind of food service as we've moved through July here. Uh, and also maybe a little more color on just the uh, uh, point between kind of organic sales and organic volume. Okay, why don't I take the first part of that, Steve, and then you can handle the second. Um, so, Mark, the way I'd characterize it, if we look at the second quarter, we would say that our, our food and beverage business was up roughly kind of 6%. You know, that, again, as you know, is about 77% of our portfolio. And the food service business was actually down about 20%. As we look at what we are seeing here in July and, and what we essentially expect for Q3, we see that range on the food and beverage probably being somewhere between five to eight, uh, you know, based on you know the various verticals that we operate in, and food service probably being somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20. So it's it's improved a little bit, uh, but not materially, as you'd expect, given all the all the information that's been out uh, you know on the news around uh, you know some of the challenges in some of these states and and uh, you know staggered restarting. So um, that's what we're seeing right now on the ground. And I'll let Steve cover the uh, the volume and. and Sales. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Good morning. Uh, just with regards to organic sales growth, the uh, 150 basis point of growth that we saw, that's a top line number, and we felt that it was the right and actually conservative approach to how we look through our business, given the mix change that we're experiencing. If you actually step back and look at it on a tons basis, um, our organic volume tonnage, our integrated tonnage, was actually up 6% in the quarter, so quite material. But there's a pretty significant mix change that's happening inside of there. Just to kind of put it into context, our traditional food and beverage folding cartons, like a beverage package, would be $1,500 plus per ton on average, whereas a food service on balance a product, a cup that includes a lid, for example, might be in the $4,000 per ton range. So we wanted to step back from the results and stare through the top line, consistent with our Vision 2025 expectations, uh, and we're very pleased uh, that the net result is a 1.5% growth in the quarter, 3% year-to-date on a top line organic sales basis. Integrated organic tons are actually higher than that, but as Mike was just saying, um, as we, you know, see some return to the food service volume, uh, that kind of natural give and take of those two changes in mix uh, will start to level playing field over time. So uh, we're very pleased with the 1.5% and the 3% year-to-date in terms of the actual top line. Okay. And then I want to just make sure I understand what you said about um, SBS downtime. I think I heard you say you took 14 days in July at Texarkana on one machine and that you're going to take another 14 days uh, along with a maintenance outage in September. Is that correct? You got that right, Mark. And so if you put that together, the incremental market uh, you know, downtime is somewhere between 25 and 30,000 tons that will occur in Q3, and that's lining our, you know, our supply with our demand, as we talked about, and that's on top of the planned outage where we'll put in a new head box on that machine um, that was already planned, and that's, uh, that's all in the month of September. Okay. And is there any way, Mike, to just take some of that uh, uh, food service-oriented SBS volume and just move it to, to other businesses? I mean, it, it would seem with that second quarter operating rate of 97% that you uh, you noted uh, from the AFNPA that, you know, SBS supply would be pretty tight right now and that maybe you could just, you know, swing volume on that machine. You know, that, that's an uncoated machine, um, you know, the cup machine itself. But you're, act, in fact, actually correct with what we've done in the second quarter. As, as you heard in my prepared comments, we talk about 100,000 tons run rate of, uh, you know, CUK business and put it in SBS. Our teams did an exceptional job of, you know, making that transition very, very fast in order to service customers and capture the growth that you heard Steve talking about. So, in fact, part of what you're seeing in terms of those strong operating rates on, on the base SPS business is the fact we've made that shift. And as you know, we're, we're pretty uniquely positioned to be able to do that, being the manufacturer of all three grades. Um, and that factors into our, our integration work that uh, you know, Steve also mentioned about, you know, going from 68% to 70% here year-to-date. So it's all part of our strategy, and, it, and, and it's working. 
and okay. it's being tested okay. in a pretty big mix change, which I think shows you know, our, our resiliency of you know the end markets that we participate in, um, and how our customers are performing through you know what most would consider you know pretty big disruption. Okay. Well, last one for me. I'm just curious. Um, are COVID-related restrictions on on things like travel, like sending technicians over to install lines for you know Coke and and other beverage companies in Europe, is that slowing down sort of you know one element of your organic growth this year? It, it is, Mark. I mean, we've lost a quarter or two as we alluded to on our first call, and that continues to be the case. We've gotten pretty good at you know, being able to do things via Zoom and FaceTime and, and that, but there are some, some things that just have to be done by our technicians. And uh, what I would point to, and, and I had that in my prepared comments too, is that we've got our really our first line in Europe that will be operational here towards the end of Q3 and into Q4. Uh, we expect that to continue to accelerate as we go into 2021. The interest for that particular specification, Keel Clip, continues to be incredibly strong. Um, it's really an issue about getting getting the machines installed and operational, and we expect uh, you know we'll have this delay, but uh, there's no no loss of interest. As a matter of fact, I, I would argue it's building. Yeah, okay. Mark, this is Steve. That uh, the delays that Mike uh, referenced are kind of timing delays, but what we haven't seen is any change in the interest level or the number of placements, and so it's a little bit of a delay. Uh, but there's no change in, in the actual number of installations consistent with our expectations. Okay, that's helpful. I'll turn it over, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Your next question is from Mark Conley of Stevens. Thank you. Um, if, if we look at your slide seven and, and your recovery of price cost, um, I'm curious what has changed other than just the, the lag. If we were to experience that kind of inflation scenario that we saw in, in 16 to 18 today, how much different would the recovery period be? Would it just be you know, a third faster, or is there more changing than just that lag? Mark and Steve, I think uh, I'll start, and Mike can uh, can add on. I think you touched on one of the key components. If we were to experience, uh, you know, significant inflation uh, in, in a, on a go forward basis, clearly the lags would be tighter, and so that's obviously a critical part of our ability to recover. You've seen, as you mentioned on slide seven, we now have fully recovered the dislocation that we did experience, which is. Uh, important to see. I think overall, though, to Mike's point, uh, the reality of the operating rates and the overall supply and demand environment is, of course, critical relative to our uh, view of that, and so that, too, would play into uh, recovery going forward. And so the overall three substrates and the operating rates and backlogs of those is obviously relevant. Yeah, I think, Mark, I'd add to Steve's comment just again, and you know this, we, we didn't even own SBS mills until January 1st of 2018. Right. So now we've got all of these substrates, and our ability to balance those three substrates across the portfolio business, as we're doing right now, if you think about what we're doing on SBS with 100,000 tons, we moved out of CUK in that. That's a big deal for us. So that helps us balance our supply and our demand you know, by being able to manufacture all three substrates. Which is clearly different. Right. Um, and, and just a philosophical question: When you when you announced the CRB hike uh, a while back, um, the trade rags were quoting customers who seemed upset that you wanted to uh, uh, avoid getting into the same mess that we're just talking about. Um, does that sort of reaction from customers is that pervasive? And does it does it you know that this is a bad time for a price hike attitude? Um, does that shift their preference or yours for how these contract terms work? You know, either you know, preferring the cost escalator, or maybe maybe the customers do prefer the the, the price index. I think you know, and you know this. I mean, really, no customer is looking forward to a price increase. So the timing is what the timing is. I think in terms of what our resolve is, and you saw us do that when OCC was going up dramatically, and we didn't know where it was going to go. We were very aggressive on making sure that we were out in front of recovering that because we want to avoid having to have another slide like the one that. We just got done talking about, and so that's that's how we're looking at it at Graphic. Um, I would say that the other part of that with customers that they want to be able to plan, and so cost models give them probably a little bit more ability to plan, uh, where they kind of you know know in the last six months what's happened, and we can kind of keep them up to speed on that. And they can build that into their forecast up or down. Uh, you know, some of our customers find that helpful. 
um, and that's that's obviously something that we offer them and, and we'll continue to do so. Okay, and if I could just squeeze one small one in. Um, in your uh, strategic action slide, you didn't uh, highlight the two uh, coders at West Monroe. Is that still on track? And yeah, okay. uh, thank you for doing that. We probably should have had something in there. We do. We are putting our uh, curtain coder in in September on our on our West Monroe number six machine. Um, and so, um, excuse me, on our number seven machine, and that'll be done in September. So we'll start getting the benefits of that in Q4, um, and then we're going to take about a year off, um, and then early 2020. Um, two, we'll install the, the last and final one on the other machine. We want to, you know, get it up and running in West Monroe and really make sure that we understand the operating parameters around it um, and then come in behind it and finish the last one. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Your next question is from Brian McGuire of Goldman Sachs. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, sort of the follow-up. On the, uh, the reporting metric switch just from uh, the uh, net, net organic volumes you had talked about before to the net organic sales, and I, um, I, I guess last quarter you, you reported net organic volumes that were up about 4%, excluding um, COVID and, and leap year, I think five if they included COVID, but excluded the leap year. And, and so are you saying that that same number would, would have been up 6% in 2Q, so it was actually a little bit better in 2Q? And you know, related to that, are you – are you now sort of committing to even, you know, offsetting the negative mix impact that you might have going forward to get uh, into the 100 to 200 basis point uh, growth range on a on an organic sales basis in addition to organic volume basis? Yeah, Brian, thank you for that. Uh, the answer is yes. The four and five percent that you referenced last quarter, this quarter was six. Uh, so overall, year to date. Uh, organic volume growth is up pretty materially, as we mentioned, driven by very strong demand uh, for our traditional core food and beverage business, particularly beverage. Um, as Mike mentioned, that also created the need and the opportunity to pivot a fair amount of volume from CUK to SBS to service uh, primarily food-based customers, uh, moving them into that product category. Um, yes, we would expect over time that both volume and uh, sales growth would both be in that 100 to 200 basis points of organic growth over time. So no change whatsoever. We just felt that here, as you look at it today, because of this pretty significant change in the mix of our products, that we actually didn't want to kind of, if you will, over what we believe over the long term might be a temporary over overstatement, that we actually stepped back and said, let's look at this through the sales lens. But very specifically, volume is up materially uh, through the first half, driven by the 77% of the business where we're seeing the at-home consumption patterns uh, stay very uh, heavy and positive relative to volume. If you think about it, Brian, what we're trying to do is make sure that you've got more of a look through to so we're actually trying to run this for Vision 2025 as opposed to a one quarter, you know, which was exceptional from a tonnage standpoint. And but we do expect over time, and we don't know, you know, what that time frame is, that we see that business come back. And that's the value per ton that Steve talked about being four thousand dollars a ton versus fifteen hundred dollars a ton. It's a big, it's a big shift. And so we're just trying to give you a better, better look through on the narrative. Maybe some would call that a bit conservative, but we think right. You know that makes sense. I just I just asked that you would take some of the you know the pricing um, out of it as we you know you do need to recover cost inflation and pricing will, will move up and down. But hope, but you know kind of a volume mix blended number makes uh, makes total sense. Um, just to switch gears yeah. a little bit. To, uh, Brian, uh, Brian, let me for clarity just so that uh, on that that def, that sales definition did exclude price and FX. So it's in the same definition, if you will, of the volume mix category. So it is the sales associated with that. So we did remove price. We did remove FX. So that, again, it's very apples to apples and, and the way to look through the company relative to the role that the, the volume of our business as measured in sales rolls forward. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a, a very good metric then. Um, just to switch gears to SBS, um, yeah, yeah, on the slides, it looks like, you know, you, you talked about the operating rate for the industry improved a little bit to 97% from, I think, 95 in 1Q and the backlogs. 
Uh, I think you talked about them being four weeks. I think last quarter slide it was kind of more three to four. Um, and, you know, recognizing a lot of things have changed on the food service side. But it sounds like, you know, some of the industry data has somewhat improved, but then, um, you know, on, on your own converting operations, you're having to take some downtime. And I think that's going to, you know, I think you said 20 to 30,000 tons of board sort of impact. So, you know, it seems like some, some, some inconsistencies between, um, you know, some of the industry data and the backlogs improving, yet the need to take some downtime. Just wondering if you could kind of, uh, uh, you know, reconcile those and talk about whether you think, you know, the industry needs to take some capacity out in SBS, whether there's a need for some some of the upstream board capacity to come out. So, Brian, I'll take that one. Let me just tell you what we're doing at Graphic. So at Graphic, what we're doing is we moved on the equivalency of about 100,000 tons, as I mentioned earlier, of CUK, predominantly CUK um, business, into our general SPS, so coded SPS uh, you know, business. And we, those conversions occurred in the second quarter. You know, they're all done now, and we're using that to balance out our, our multi-mill system. Um, Specifically, where we have the weakness is on that uncoated cup machine because the you know, demand profile of uh, you know, food service being down that 15 to 20 percent that I that I referenced uh, to a previous question. And so, what we're doing about that, in addition to having a normal plan maintenance, pretty significant maintenance outage to take care of that um, new head box that we're putting on on that machine, um, is taking an additional. Think about it this way: 28 days of uh, downtime in Q3 uh, to balance our supply and our demand. And so that's how we're looking at, at solving for that. The general SBS market for us that we're participating in is strong, and it's, it's, it's evidenced by the fact those operating rates year-to-date, you know, AFPA number, 95.3 versus 91.7, um, you know, last year. And that reflects, you know, the closure of one of our competitors taking a mill out um, and the, incur you know, the, obviously the bump on that. So within those numbers, the weakness is the food service grade that we make. It's about 400,000 of our 1.2 uh, million tons. And we're managing our supply and our demand by taking some economic downtime. And I just outlined that for you. So I, I, I'd ask you to think about it that way. Okay, that makes sense. And just last one for me. Might be a little unfair to compare the um, the uh, EBITDA guidance components, the, the line items, to the original guidance, but but just looking at it, it looks like price is is a 25 million dollar unfavorable, and commodity cost deflation is a 45 million dollar favorable swing. So just wondering if you could kind of talk about you know versus the original plan for the year, why why price is a little bit weaker, and and what's driving the commodity cost to be uh, quite a bit strong, uh, more favorable. Yeah, Brian, Steve, from the original guide that we provided uh, when we announced Q4 earnings, uh, we had the modest movement down that was uh, on, on uh, CRB and SPS, which we took into consideration. And then there's been, uh, obviously, in this deflationary environment, some of our cost models. Uh, so that's why we have the, the new range of price in the zero to $20 million range. When we originally guided, we could do what we felt was a pretty uh, modest inflation uh, for the year, 1% roughly on the $2.5 billion spend. Uh, we actually are now guiding to uh, some modest deflation in the 10 to $30 million range. Obviously, we're in a, in a recessionary environment. We are experiencing some actual deflation. And most of the net of that uh, is occurring in the areas of fiber-related costs. Yes, OCC costs have moved up and have now moved down. Uh, but as we talked quite a bit last year, wood was a major inflationary item for us. Last year, wood has normalized in the South uh, back to more historic levels, and, that, and that's creating deflation uh, year over year on the wood basket. The rest of the infrastructure of costs, logistics, chemicals, residents, et cetera, pretty neutral. Um, overall, the deflation net is generally fiber-based, with wood being the predominant reason for that. Okay, thanks very much. Take care. Thanks, Brian. Your next question is from George Stathos of Bank of America. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking uh, my question. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, thanks for the details. I guess I have three questions. You know, we'll go from sort of process and operations to kind of a bigger picture one. But I guess, first of all, when we look at paper seal, and you know, we also look at 
uh, in somewhat a related way, the, the shift of the CUK tons to SBS. You know, what kind of changes in runnability are you seeing uh, at either your converting locations or in the case of, of paper seal for your customers? Can the customer use that paper tray with existing uh, equipment that they have, uh, or would they have to make modifications in your converting areas? Are you seeing any change at all, any tweaks, any loss of throughput? doesn't seem that way, by the way. Uh, you're moving from CUK to bleach board. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, I'll, um, I'll take that. Uh, you know, in terms of paper seal, that's a new line that the customer would actually purchase, and our interest there is supplying the tray, the paper tray that goes in there. Predominantly, as you know, on a lot of those, it's been polystyrene foam. So we're replacing yep. polystyrene yeah. foam with paper, um, fiber-based you know, packaging, which is what we do. So that's our interest there, and we're working with a number of different people that actually uh, you know, sell those lines, and uh, we're seeing a lot of traction on that in Europe and Australia, as, as we reference there. It's a pretty big addressable market, so we find that interesting you know, for us. And our ability to manufacture that is pretty straightforward with the existing equipment that we've we've gotten really all of our converting plans. In regards to the CUK to SBS shift, um, you know, that we run all three of those substrates all the time in our in our facilities, so we know how to convert them. Um, you know, the vast majority of what we moved into SBS out of CUK came from there. And so it started, you know, there's some frozen pizza and there's some other things in there that used to be, you know, on SBS and, and then we moved it to CUK and now we've moved it back in order to balance out our, our demand. We've worked with those customers to make sure we can meet their heightened, you know, demand levels and they've worked with us on that. So it performs well on their lines. It doesn't require material, you know, adjustments uh, to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, all in all, you know, the overall execution on that has been pretty seamless, as you referenced. Thanks, Mike. Um, as far as Kalamazoo goes, I know one of the intents, at least I, this is what I recall, one of the intentions with that machine was to have greater fiber flexibility given, you know, the, the variability that you see in the different grades of recovered fiber. With, you know, graphic paper demand being down so much and implicitly there being uh, longer term more inflation in sort of office papers, does that change at all? Probably not. But does that change all, you know, any of the return assumption that you have for the new Kalamazoo machine? And, and more broadly, with this machine coming on, are you seeing any increased interest from your customers, recognizing you're going to basically be just replacing older capacity and using more CRB in their their business mix from what had been previously the case. Yes, thanks for the question on Kalamazoo. I was there two weeks ago. I have to tell you, you know, our team there is doing an outstanding job as we referenced in the materials. You know, we're on plan, uh, you know, both uh, in terms of the timeline as well as the budget for that project. Um, so I appreciate the question. And in regards to the actual input cost and paper that we would use, um, we're going to have a lot of flexibility there. That machine, like like our K1 machine is going to have a curtain coater on it. So the amount of white paper that we have to use close to the surface, you know, balancing off the coating, if you will, um, is going to be materially better than anybody else in the space. So we'll have a lot more flexibility to be able to do it. We've anticipated that. That's how we built the machine. So, yes, the, uh, the down, um, you know, the smaller uh, market size of the uh, printing and writing paper. Well, certainly something we watch is not, you know, material impact to the overall economics, uh, you know, in terms of what we put uh, on the project. As a matter of fact, it, it hasn't impacted it at all. Um, we'll be able to deal with those kind of disruptions and dislocations much better than anybody else in the space. And that's part of why we're doing the project in addition to the fact, uh, you know, we were taking on a lot of older capacities we talked about. In regards to how customers are feeling about it, um, you know, look, I, you see all the sustainability goals and targets our customers have put out there. So when you look at what that machine is going to do, you know, as I've, as I've referenced a few times, I mean, we're going to use 300 million gallons less water a year. We're going to buy, you know, 20 percent less electricity. We're going to generate 18 percent less greenhouse gases across our CRB platform. And these are real material numbers that will help our customers actually accomplish their sustainability goals. So when people are looking to, you know, find a, a, a solution to meet those targets, we've got an answer. And it's a different answer than really than anybody else has. So in addition to having you know the lowest cost, highest quality material, you know we've got a great sustainability story there, and they like that. Thanks, Mike. My, my last question, I'll turn it over. You know, and, and 
Brian touched on this in one way in terms of your guidance. You know, it's it, in some ways as we step back, it's it's remarkable what we've seen over the last quarter. You're more or less back to your prior guidance, both on EBITDA and on free cash flow. Yet there's been this tremendous amount of volatility in demand in the economy, and you know, ultimately, you you not with a lot of without a lot of effort, I'm sure you skated through it. So when you think about um, how ultimately graphic packaging, uh, maybe this isn't the term you'd use, you know, filled the hole, uh, you know, and, and kept guidance and get to performance where it needs to be, where it had been, what was the biggest driver? Is it that we've gone through this period and the consumer now has a greater appreciation for paperboard and you've seen, we've seen a sustainable increase in demand from here? Is it just a one-off where there's a lot of pantry loading and, yes, we got through this year, but next year there's going to be uh, a chicken come home to roost effect on volume. How do you think you got through this and the sustainability of that imp- improvement into 21 and 22 and beyond? Thank you, guys. Good luck in the quarter. Thanks, George. Appreciate the question. I think I'd have you look at you know our market participation strategies and how we have over the last you know decade really built this business. And, and if you look at our big food business, and you look at our beverage business, and you look at our consumer products business, and all that comprises about 77% of the company. We add food service under it. Yes, food service is down now, but look what's up. We've got the food and beverage up because people are eating and provisioning more at home. To your point, so will food service come back? We believe it'll come back. To what level? we don't know for sure, and we don't know what period of time, but I'd ask you to think about that as a little bit of a teeter-totter. As food service comes up, you'll see a little bit of kind of the food and beverage go down, but the net impact of that you know, balances out for graphic, and what we're able to do then is use our, our new product innovation um, and our low-cost investments that we've made to continue to grow the business, and that's what gives us confidence in that 100 to 200 basis points of growth. And so, you know, this year has been exceptional in terms of how that has all performed, and we've netted it out well. I appreciate the comment, and as I referenced, I think our, our team has done an excellent job of executing through a pretty – Pretty challenging economic backdrop, but it shows the resiliency of our customer portfolio and the operating model that we've got in place. Yeah, and George, just to add to that, uh, because it was an exceptional effort across the entire organization to manage significant increases in demand as well as obviously the areas of, of weakness. But And one of the things that hasn't been touched on, but I'll touch on it is, is on volume mix, that resulted in a modest headwind on volume mix because we were scrambling in a significant way uh, to obviously take out uh, capacity in our cup making business uh, appropriately to match the needs of making actual cups, but more importantly, moving that SBS you know, from CUK, moving production into facilities that maybe haven't made a beverage carton but now are, you know, shifting the actual uh, portfolio in a pretty material way which cost a little bit on the volume mix, but we've now achieved that. And as we continue to roll forward, we can optimize from there. So our overall, and I think it's critical to what Mike's saying, our overall belief relative to the organic growth profile of the business, kind of seen through that in 100 to 200 basis points, remains intact with a different mix and some phenomenal work being done across the organization to manage both the ups and the downs uh, through this environment of people needing to eat and drink. Thank you very much. Thank you. As a reminder to those in the queue, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question. Your next question is from Phil Ng of Jeffrey. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, congrats on a really solid quarter in a tough environment. Um, appreciate you're taking the downtime to kind of balance supply demand, but curious, how's the uh, pricing environment and c- competitive landscape for your cups business uh, and food service business? I'm sorry, Phil, welcome back. Uh, in terms of our, Thank our you. customers, it, it, were you referring to our, our customers? Uh, we're just trying to get a better sense of how the competitive landscape is in terms of who you compete with on the cup side. Uh, is everyone behaving nicely, the pricing environment, in terms of what you're selling your products? I'm trying to get it just because demand's obviously down quite a bit. 
Hey, Phil, it's Mike. I, and again, welcome back. I, you know, we're not going to talk about the competitive rivalry out in, in the market. I mean, I, I, what I want you to know is what we're doing to actually, you know, compete, you know, in that space and, and meet those requirements. And if, if you heard Steve, what he just got done talking about, we've, we've right-sized our converting platform in terms of, you know, the, the amount of people and the amount of lines that we're running to match up with the actual demand we have. And then in Q3 here, <clears throat> excuse me, we're taking a fair amount of market re related downtime on our cup machine to balance that out. <clears throat> and that's all reflected in the AFMPA numbers, you know, year to date. So it's a pretty healthy operating rate. So I think I'd point to that. Yeah, and it's reflected okay. in the guide as well. Got it. That, that's re really helpful. And appreciating if you uh, choose to use GPK stock, it's not that dilutive at all. But the potential incremental 250 million stake from IP potentially uh, becoming available on the back half. Are you comfortable use that, use, utilizing your cash flow and balance sheet to fund the event? Uh, certainly, you have a lot of liquidity. Yeah, thanks, Phil. And I think what we were trying to do on page 12 is to just remind us that we do have incredible flexibility on how we uh, monetize uh, an IP stake. Obviously, they began that process in the first half, and uh, the next opportunity to begin to do so um, is tomorrow, actually, in terms of the next potential for them to begin to uh, potentially monetize. And what we were conveying was just that. We've got a great balance sheet. Um, excellent flexibility, and I'll you know remind you, and you know this, we've actually bought back $157 million of the company uh, year to date. That price is in the mid-12s. Uh, we've got line of sight uh, leverage that's in that two and a half to three times range. Our original guidance uh, indicated that we could acquire back the second $250 million and still be at the high end of our two and a half to three times. Uh, that's only modestly changed, mostly because we've acquired back the business uh, into acquiring our own GPK shares. So we really continue to like the flexibility we have in the context of our capital allocation strategies, in the context of the value of our currency, that being GPK shares. So uh, excellent flexibility uh, dependent upon how they choose uh, to continue with their monetization, assuming they choose to do so. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. Thanks a lot. Good luck in the court. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Your next question is from Debbie Jones of Deutsche Bank. Hi, good morning. Um, my first question is I was wondering, just because your, your free cash flow range is a little uh, wider than your EBITDA range, um, what has to happen for you to hit kind of the high end of your, your, free, your targeted free cash flow range? Hey, Debbie, it's Steve. I, I think the high end, if you kind of look at the variability, will be around working capital. Uh, I think overall uh, that would be in terms of the cash flow. We've got very good plans for inventory coming out of the business in the second half of the year. We have materially more natural planned market-related downtime in the second half. In addition, or excuse me, planned natural uh, maintenance downtime. And then as Mike mentioned, the incremental market-related downtime. So driving uh, inventory out of the business, uh, first half to second half, will uh, be a key indicator for being at the higher end of the range, assuming uh, kind of, if you will, uh, kind of a natural midpoint on the adjusted EBITDA. I think that's really the, you know, for the most part, um, our interest expense and taxes and pension will be in line with the, the midpoint of the range roughly that we have for you. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Um, and then second question, uh, Mike, you, you mentioned helping your customers hit their sustainability goals. Can you help us understand, you know, what percentage or ballpark of your customer base is leaning on you to help um, improve, you know, kind of their, their value chain metrics? Um, and then what beyond the, you know, the new mail that, you know, you can do to help them with that? You know, Debbie, I'd say, you know, over 90%, I mean, be the, really the most – the smallest customers that we have, maybe perhaps some of them aren't as um, aggressive on some of those goals. But if you look at our top 25 accounts, for sure, every one of them has got a very ambitious goal, you know, for cost takeout. Well, not just cost takeout, but carbon takeout, if you, if you think about it, over over that period of time in terms of what they want on greenhouse gases and uh, electricity and water and those types of things. And so it's very important that we have answers that move the needle. Um, that's part of how we're making those investments and really looking back into it. So I, I'd say it's, you know, the majority of them. Okay, thanks. I'll turn it over. 
Your next question is from Mark Weintraub of Seaport Global. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned the teeter-tarter between um, cartons and food service, and you know, hopefully that's going to teeter back the other way. Um, is food service more profitable? Is that one of the issues on the, um, on the impact to mix as well? And so does that become a favorable if it does go back the other way? Mark and Steve, now I wouldn't uh, necessarily go down that path. Overall, as you know, um, our, our economics and big platforms have some commonality to them. We've been improving the overall economics of the SBS platform and the cup business since uh, acquiring that business two and a half years ago. Uh, so I don't think you'll see material movements in terms of that impacting volume mix. It really goes back to what we talked about a moment ago. We had a lot of activity here in the quarter adjusting to both the ins and the outs. Um, but overall, we still we would expect over time to earn volume mix positive across the portfolio of products uh, as we look out over the next several years. So I wouldn't characterize it as a difference in profitability. It's more a difference in the kind of the top line mix and the tons that are utilized to support that business. And Mark, the only thing I'd add. Of course, we're going to spend $12 million, you know, we expect to spend $12 million in the quarter in terms of that market economic downtime. So obviously that would go away if food service comes back. Yeah. Well, but that's yeah. in our guide. Okay. And um, two other real quick ones. One, so you had a couple of acquisitions, um, which presumably wouldn't have been in your original EBITDA. Of course, you didn't have FX as a negative either. But um, order of magnitude, um, on the acquisitions, how much um, might that be contributing to the – 2020 numbers? Uh, consistent with what we original, originally guided, Mark, overall, the, in terms of what we acquired and committed to, we're on the on the trajectory. So it's net, net favorable EBITDA. Uh, it was in, in our kind of early guides, if you will, based as we, as we put those out there, I think announced after Q1. So we're really pleased, as I mentioned in the commentary, with the uh, synergy capture. Uh, we, we're consolidating some facilities into lower cost facilities. We're capturing logistics uh, improvements across the, the CRB platforms. And so overall, uh, we're in line with the commitments for both uh, the Greif business and the uh, and the Quad businesses that we acquired to meet the uh, couple year expectations we had for uh, EBITDA and synergy capture. Okay, great. So Quad was in the, the original guide back in January. Uh, I, I understood. I didn't realize that. And it, then, it was. Thanks. And then lastly, um, so with the commodity input costs having been a favorable, um, are there contractual givebacks or is wood treated differently somehow perhaps than some of the other input items, or is that something that, you know, you'll you work to offset it in other ways, but uh, how should we think about that? You know, the, the vast majority of our contracts that would use virgin wood are, are market-based, so, you know, that it's not impacted by any any reduction there, nor if it, it runs like it did last year, is it is covered mark. So I, I ask you to think about it that way. Those kind of contracts are more on our recycled business, on our CRP business, the cost models. Super. Thank you. Thanks, Our next Mark. question is from Anthony Pettineri of City. Uh, good morning. Um, you know, there's there's been some commentary in the trade press about slightly more input pressure in SBS and CRB, and it, it sounds like you know most of your SBS markets are strong, and you're taking adjustments where you need to. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on on imports or whether that's something that you're sort of increasingly coming up against. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anthony, for the question. I, you know, let's break down really and do all three substrates in terms of you know working off the census data, which is the best we have in terms of imports. And uh, if you start with uh, you know CRB in the beginning, um, when you look at CRB, most of the CRB historically has come from either Canada or uh, Korea, a um, little bit from China, but not much of any recent time. And actually, those numbers are down year to date on the CRB in terms of imports into the U.S. Um, so on that one, uh, that would be the case. And of course, we, we operate one of those mills, uh, you know, in Canada that makes CRB. So some of that could be us just shifting our business around over time. Um, if we look at uh, CUK or CUK equivalents, uh, specifically from South America, um, you know, the combined production and imports last year 
uh, you know, here we're roughly 50,000 tons. Um, in year to date, it's up 2,000 tons, so pretty small. I mean, less than 2% of the overall market, uh, if you think about it that way. In regards to FBB, that's been the biggest one, as you know, uh, principally coming out of Europe. You've got, you know, Finland and Sweden uh, year to day, best we can tell, are up about 30,000 tons. That's com consistent with you know, really what our expectations would have been, uh, but that's been partially offset by a pretty significant drop-off in ivory board from China. Uh, so, you know, the net net of all that is it's it's very de minimis in terms of imports. Okay, that that's extremely helpful detail. Um, and then just following up maybe on George's earlier question, I mean, in your view, is any of the food and bev demand that you saw in 2Q, which seemed pretty strong, was any of that sort of, you know, pantry loading or stockpiling or, or channel fill that, that doesn't show up in 3Q? Or do you think, I mean, roughly that rate of demand should be fairly you consistent know, with 3Q? You know, it's a great question. And I, I don't know if we have a perfect answer, you know, but what we can tell you is we're seeing a similar trend here, you know, in July to what we saw in Q2. You know, so I'd answer it that way. I mean, best we know, um, you know, it's it's holding up, you know, about the same. People have worked through that stuff at home, I would think, and they're just there's more meals being eaten at home right now and less meals being eaten out, and it shows in our numbers. But you know, the great thing about the resiliency of our our portfolio is that that balances out in a way that uh, we're still able to, you know, generate economic value here for our shareholders. Yeah, I think Anthony, it's tough to argue a pantry load five to six months into a pandemic. I think uh, things do turn over pretty naturally. Great. That's very helpful. I'll turn it over. Your next question is from Gansham Panjabi of Bayer. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, I guess as, just as a follow-up to the last question, a lot, a lot of food companies have been talking about, you know, just purely matching point of sale, just given elevated uh, sales at the retail level and, Inventories are pretty low as it is. Uh, I guess on the flip side of what you just said, you know, are we setting up for a period where, you know, the 77% of your portfolio that is non-food service continues to outgrow their legacy baseline, even as food service normalizes? Uh, I mean, what's your what's your sense just talking to customers? Yeah, Dr. Steve, I think as we were just talking, Mike and I were just talking uh, with you and others here earlier. I think, yes, there'll be some natural normalization uh, of volumes as, as people do turn eventually out into a, a work-based and away-from-home environment. But that being said, the organic volume growth commitments we have through sustainability-related conversions, so beverage growth on a global basis, cup conversions, bowl conversions, that's really was the catalyst for our vision 2025. And so you kind of have to look through the realities of, of in and out, if you will, of this, uh, this difficult and unusual time and look through the, our, our view of the actual net organic volume initiatives that we're executing on, which give us the confidence that organic volume and sales growth will uh, be consistent and available based upon the actual initiatives we have underway. Okay, and then I'm sorry if I missed this, but you know, can you touch on how Europe performed during the quarter? I mean, a lot of a lot of companies have been talking about beverages being particularly weak in Europe, especially Southern Europe. Uh, you know, what, what what did you see in the second quarter, and what are your expectations for the back half for that region? Our business in Europe was strong, gotcha. And, and again, we're running a little different race than some because we're replacing you know a lot of uh, you know shrink wrap film and, and other plastics. Uh, you know, with fully enclosed fiber and keel clip and those kind of projects. So you know, we're driving you know, some real growth there year on year, and it's, it's a strong business for us. Got it. Thanks so much. Yeah. And at this time, I'd like to turn the call back to Mike Doss for any closing remarks. Thank you for joining us on our earnings call today. We'll look forward to talking to you again in October. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.